Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual or semi-annual uh, Introduction to Process Thought. And I decided that I should do something more ambitious. And so uh, I wanted to show why process is indispensable to every degree at CST. Or uh, punning on Woody Allen, everything you ever wanted to know about <clears throat> process, but we're afraid to ask. Um, and you might know that you came to the wrong room because uh, Whitehead is hopelessly incomprehensible. <laughs> uh, and so an introduction to process thought um, in layperson's terms can't possibly succeed, right? Um, and in case you weren't sure, I just want to remind you um, of the eight categories of existence, the 27 categories of explanation, 16 pages later, and the nine categorial obligations. So who can uh, recite the nine yeah, categorial right. obligations? Okay, if John Cobb can do it, I'll buy you dinner. Okay, and then, uh, so I just thought I'd give you one random quote. You know, I open the uh, book and put my finger down. Here, uh, here we have uh, Whitehead in the original. With the purpose of obtaining a one substance cosmology, prehensions are a generalization from Descartes' mental cogitations and from Locke's ideas to express the most concrete mode of analysis applicable to every grade of individual actuality. Is it clear? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I also remember a famous or notorious class that David Griffin, our other process colleague, used to teach here. And he would make people actually understand process and reality at least according to his interpretation. There's a famous chart I'm going to find and scan for my next presentation of a concrescence. It has 46 parts, and it moves, and the entire vocabulary of this book is contained in one chart. <laughs> um, so I actually believe that the core ideas of process can be put far more simply, and I hope in a more attractive manner. So let me try it. Here are some cool process ideas. Sherry Kling is really interested in process spirituality. Um, and if you go to process and faith under its new um, incarnation, uh, you'll find that uh, its new avatar, you'll find that there are a number of blogs that really present process in concrete ways. Another person I think is brilliant at this is Jay McDaniel. And if you haven't gone to his website, Jesus, Jazz, and Buddhism, then you really should. So it's absolutely not true that language like what I read a moment ago is the only meaning of process thought. There's far more there. Um, so on uh, processandfaith.com, and, um, in a um, blog that appeared today by Darren uh, Iam Marino, he suggests the notion of process yoga. And if you know something about yoga and process thought, that's an extremely rich uh, synthesis. Um, I think we should develop, we'll do it in John Cobb's living room, a process dojo. So a dojo is a Japanese term which means literally place of the way. Or in, in Chinese it would be dao. It's a training place for martial arts. The ending is do uh, in Japanese for way, right? Which is obviously uh, derived from the, from the Chinese. So how about a process dojo? It actually makes more sense that process is practiced and not taught. So process psychology, well known. Process meditation, could you imagine exactly what that would be? We'd love to talk about that. A process approach to interreligious dialogue developed here in, in the, um, uh, in the uh, 1980s. I'll turn that off. Process economics something that we've been working on recently, and of course, process theology. So I want to give a general introduction, run you through some of the concepts of process in the simplest way I can do it, and then apply them to each of the major theological disciplines, all the parts of what we do at CST, or what you may do at the other seminaries or places that you've been trained. So I'll take seven different disciplines and show how they actually manifest this, these core ideas of process that I'll be presenting. But first of all, we have to ask, what's process? And why should we put such an emphasis on it? Well, it seems to me that the human being, that each of us knows, human beings are constantly in change. 
Not only that, but nature is constantly in change. Plants and animals show a constant transformation. Leaves come, leaves go. We often talk about the rose. because It's so valuable because it exists for such a short period of time, at least you, if you buy your bouquet advance. And then it sort of collapses immediately after that. So we, we know of human existence the shortness, the briefness um, of what we actually do. Oh, there it is. Isn't that lovely? Uh, so water, for example, is a great metaphor of process. It's always in flux. It never stops. It seems to me that this vision of ubiquitous process has the ability to pull us toward the common good, to set our eyes on that which is the common good, to go beyond ourselves, recognizing that we ourselves are constantly changing, to, to recognize that the world, and this is what process would teach, is deeply related to God and permeated by God's vision for the future of the world. That all living things are interconnected by this common connection each of us have with the divine. Through this interrelatedness, if we're all responsive to the ongoing lure of God, we have the ability to coincide with the divine will to help build a greater harmoni harmonious whole. And that goes to everything, including the environment. The trade winds, the currents of the ocean, uh, have effects on the entire world. Southern Californians think that El Nino is something that happens in Southern California. But the fires in Indonesia and the growing drought in Africa and the wetness of the East Coast are all related to that heating of the Pacific, which is the El Nino current. All things are interrelated. So if that's what process is, what isn't process thought? <laughs> When I was a young Presbyterian, in order to get to the grape juice and the crackers, I was forced to memorize the nature of God from the Westminster Confession. And I actually still remember it. Um, I probably don't. I'd fail my Presbyterian <laughs> nature. <laughs> in, the being of God is, in, God is infinite in, oh, God is spirit, infinite and eternal in his being and perfections. And so I got through that question. The next one on the mimeograph sheet was, um, and what are the divine perfections? List at least six. <laughs> you know, I started sweating and, and so forth. And so here, I looked up the answer. Uh, here, God is a spirit, and here are some of the qualities. Infinite in being, glory, blessedness, perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, and so forth. You can read them, right? Long suffering. But the question is, can one do, uh, fulfill that promise in the context of classical theism? So here's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which says to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the Church needed certain terms, substance, person, hypostasis, relation, and so forth. Right? And here's what they meant. The Church used the term substance, or essence, or nature, to designate the divine being in its unity and hypostasis to mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the real distinction among them. So the idea is that there's a container in Aristotle, Hupokaimenon, that holds a bunch of qualities. And some of them are essential qualities, and others are accidental. But what exists are the container described by its properties, especially its essential ones. God, in the threefold nature of God, is the same thing. There's one substance one core being of God, and three hypostases, right? So you had one substance or essence. Then you had the debate. Do you think it is God is homoousios, the relationship be between God and Christ, or homoousios, the I, the one I difference between the two words turned out to be something that you would kill people for. <laughs> That wouldn't be exactly the process way. So maybe we need to leave that box behind. <laughs> and ask, how would a, what would be a process understanding of the God-world relation according to this kind 
and happy looking man, <laughs> Alfred North Whitehead. All right. So let's see how process thinkers have understood this relationship. We think that God's love needs to be received much more intimately than the divine touch. Not a reaching out of a separate being just to touch the finger, but something far more intimate, something that actually was known by aboriginal peoples, by the indigenous peoples of the world, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, the sense that the divine was far more close and intimate than this reaching out of Michelangelo in the picture. No matter what religion we're discussing, uh, this is actually Stu Kaufman in a recent book, God's the most powerful symbol we know. We should continue to use this word even despite the dangers. As an ancient symbol of reverence, God is our name, and he says in a very whitehead in way, for the creativity in nature. This God is how our universe unfolds. This God is our own humanity. In the Orthodox Christian world, that would be unacceptable. We'd be putting wood on the fire out there on the grass to burn me, right? Uh, as they did to Giordano Bruno in 1600, mm -hmm. right? Which I once said on Vatican Radio live, and I, I saw a number of black coats and white collars and very red faces, right? <laughs> um, but God is our name for the creativity in nature. And that interaction, God is our own humanity, is the direction in which process pushes. Panentheism is the technical word for this kind of a relationship. And since this is CST, I get to use one technical term. Right? I promise I don't get two. Right? So pan, according to Charles Hartshorn, panentheism is the view that all things are within the being of God, who, however, is not merely the whole of actual things. Or, as Clayton puts it more simply, it affirms that the world is within God, but God is also more than the world. That's the position that is being offered in process thought. Andrew Davis and I are editing a book now. Matthew Fox just said yesterday, I don't know if you saw, Sheldrake is in it and so forth. So we're, we're making good progress. Panentheism emphasizes the relatedness of the divine to the entire natural world. As Michael Bradley says in a book we published some years ago on panentheism called In Whom We Live and Move and Have Our Being, uh, Briarley writes, panentheism is the result of conceiving being or becoming, I would say, in terms of relationship or relatedness. And this is why process theism is really a type of panentheism. I think that's really important to recognize. Now, what is this panentheism? Well, one way to understand it is by understanding what it's not. What lies to the left and the right of it? It lies between traditional theism and pantheism. And David Griffin puts it really nicely. Panentheism brings out the fact it combines features of both pantheism, which regards God as essentially imminent and in no way transcendent. That's a great definition of pantheism. And on the other hand, traditional theism, which regards God as essentially transcendent and only accidentally imminent. That is the most precise definition of those two terms I have ever seen. And placing uh, panentheism in the middle suggests that God is both transcendent and imminent. If the transcendent language bothers you, think a little bit about the imminent divine the imminent divine. One could give a whole talk on that topic alone. What it leads to is a full reciprocity between God and the world. Formulated by Whitehead at the end of this book, Process and Reality, on page 348. Oh, that's just, yeah, it wasn't the electricity. Um, Jay didn't want that part, so we darkened the room. <laughs> um, in a series of, in a sense, they're um, antinomies. Uh, but he says, not really. These, each phrase is actually consistent. It's as true to say that God is permanent and the world in flux as that the world is permanent and God is in flux. 
It's as true to say that God is one and the world many as that the world is one and God many. It's as true to say that the world is imminent in God as that God is imminent in the world. That's the most panentheistic of the quotes. Can everyone see the phrase, or am I in your way? I'm in your way. And Michael's in your way, but I'm larger than him. Okay. It's as true to say that God transcends the world as that the world transcends God. That's a fascinating and a challenging one. It's as true to say that God creates the world as that the world creates God. What does that emphasize? The divine responsiveness. And I want to come back to that theme in a moment. So you can see from David Griffin's description that it focuses on God's creative power and that each finite actual entity, so for example you, has its own creativity with which to exercise some degree of self-determination so that it transcends the divine influence upon it. So God never coerces you so that your next action is nothing but what God forced you to do by making you do it. Your action always has some freedom. There's always a creativity on your part. It's never control. You might notice that this view for a, a form of theism has a lot more of a place for nature. In fact, David Griffin would say it can actually be a naturalistic position. So he describes the naturalism of process theism and uh, says that it overcomes the main arguments against the existence of God, such as these three, the problem of evil, the evolutionary nature of our universe, and the existence of many religions. These actually are brought into the heart of process thought, rather than standing against it as things to worry about. If you read uh, classical Christian apologetics or defense of the faith, you'll find that all three of these are considered major dangers to Christian theology. And people spill oh gosh, tens of thousands of pages of ink in order to address these issues. Process embraces all of them without any hesitation as a part of the overall picture, I think, without inconsistency. All right, so what you have in this view is the sense that we speak here of God and a world, not of the divine alone or the world alone, but the sense of the relatedness, God and a world. And uh, here's this radical claim going back to Samuel Alexander in 1918. God is essentially the soul of the universe, being related to the universe somewhat in way in the way that the human soul is related to its body. I call, in my early work, I called that the panentheistic analogy. I think that's a fascinating notion. Uh, feminist theologians like um, Sally McFaig use that relationship, and Grace Jensen, a, a famous uh, uh, feminist theologian, also used the phrase, the world as God's body. I think that this has a, a spiritual or devotional power that it's hard to limit. Samuel Alexander put it really beautifully. All we are the hunger and thirst, the very heartbeats of God. You can say that in process. Don't think you can say that in classical theism. All right, what kind of ethics? Now we turn to the theological discipline of ethics. What kind of ethics does process thought give rise to. Let's just explore it briefly in just um, four or five slides. So Charles Hartsarn, John Cobb's teacher, uh, says, we are in the free, we are in, concentrate on that word, in the free, partly contingent divine life, having our own contingency and freedom, right? So the divine is not about power and control, but also has this passive aspect. The key here is that there's a relationship, a relationality between all of us and the divine so deeply that it actually means we're internally related, not just by what is happening externally, but inside we're related. And the person I think who's put that most beautifully and powerfully is Marjorie Suhaki in a book called God, Christ, and Church, page 33 where she says, if all this is true, then wouldn't we have to say that God is the supremely related one? 
how ironic that the scholastic thinker said God is the one that can have no relation to anything. Going back to Aristotle, whose unmoved mover didn't even know that he, I guess, had given rise to a universe because couldn't have any knowledge of or relationship to the universe. Even Thomas Aquinas says that God can't know anything contingent. So God knows your essential character as human being, which, by the way, is shared by all humans. But God can't know the color of clothes you have or what your experience with your partner is like or anything like that without ceasing to be God. And contrast that with Marjorie's concept, God is the supremely relatedness, related one. And I think that leads to an ethic. If we're related, even internally related, then it leads to an understanding of wholeness and integrity. Because the divine, God is the wholeness of the world, which correlates the wholeness of every sound individual who deals with the, word, the world. And continuing with Hartshorn, God now can become the supreme and most excellent example of goodness, of knowledge, and of similar concepts. God is not the exception, but as Whitehead said, the chief exemplification of everything we know and experience in the world. The chief exemplification, the chief example. And the concept that we should use for that, the concept that lies behind these words, is the concept of love. And I think this quote is, is worth reading in full, if I can move off the camera for a moment. Panentheism is the re result of process, mutuality, reciprocity, or love, being made foundational to being or becoming. This is why love, as a term expressing relation, isn't that right? Love is about the deepest kind of relatedness. It's such an important concept for process theologians. Um, and why attention to love has been the cause of much doctrinal revisionism. Tom Orr, a graduate of this uh, school, a doctoral student of uh, David uh, Griffin, has just published a book. He's published many on love, but a more recent one on divine providence, emphasizing this. It was the number one best-selling book under systematic theology and a second category. What was it? Um, like grief and suffering. Yeah, yeah. On, on Amazon. So uh, I recommend Ord, O-O-R-D, and his most recent book. All right, what does process say, not today, about Jesus and about Christology? This being a seminary, it seemed important to mention that. So we'll start with, again, Charles Hartshorn. Jesus' devotion to his fellows was not mere benevolence or wishing them well. I love that expression, right? It was a feeling of sympathetic identity with them in their troubles and sufferings, as well as in their joys, so that their cause and their tragedy became his. That is one of the most beautiful sentences I know for beginning a Christology. Who was Jesus? And let's continue with Hartshorn, because this is great. We fight over what it meant to say Jesus is God, but for Hartshorn it's easy. To say that Jesus was God ought to mean that God, God's self, is one with us in our suffering. Man, if we could just drop the debates and take that first sentence mm -hmm. and then live accordingly, wouldn't that be the heart of a, of a faith-based or a Jesus-based ethic? <clears throat> that, that sentence matters. And a lot of the sentences in the books that I teach <clears throat> don't matter, right? God, God's self, is one with us in suffering. Divine love is not a kind of external well-wishing, but sympathy taking into itself our every grief. grief. Sympathy, sum, together, pathi, pathos, to have feeling together or compassion together, sympathy. It also leads to a deeply biblical uh, notion of called kenosis or self-emptying and the sense that um, in powerlessness, is the greatest power. So Whitehead writes in Religion in the Making, the life of Christ is not an exhibition of overruling power, but rather its power lies in its absence of force. Or as 2 Corinthians said, my, um, my power is made perfect in weakness, for when you are weak, then you are strong. I think we need to embrace that paradox as process thought embraces that paradox. 
Now, Whitehead has one passage on Jesus, very famous, but nobody can do the introduction talk without reading it. And it's, it's so beautifully done, I won't make any comment about it, except to say that it's not saccharine. You couldn't teach it in a fourth grade Sunday school. But maybe we need some notions of God or of Christ that can't be taught in a fourth grade sun, Sunday school that are actually mature enough for thinking men and women in the world that we really live in. And please read this uh, passage from the end of Process and Reality in that way. There is, however, in the Galilean origin of Christianity, yet another suggestion, which doesn't fit very well with any of the three main strands of thought, which he just talked about. This Galilean origin of Christianity doesn't emphasize the ruling Caesar or the ruthless moralist or the unmoved mover. It dwells upon the tender elements of the world, which slowly and in quietness operate by love. And it finds purpose in the present immediacy of a kingdom not of this world. Love neither rules nor is it unmoved. It is also a little oblivious as to morals. Think Kierkegaard. It does not look to the future, for it finds its own reward in the immediate present. Processing Reality, page 343. I recommend that you go home, look it up in your pocket copy of Processing Reality, <laughs> and, and think a little bit about that. All right, is that enough of a, of a background? Can we move on to CST? So part six of my talk, it's rather lengthy, is what Wrighthead wrote about CST. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Sorry. So you can go home and get, no, you can get the punch and cookies now. Uh, well then, what does process have to say slightly more generally about the theological disciplines? And I want to continue, uh, consider these seven examples. And under spirituality, because I thought John Cobb wouldn't be here, I brought a picture of him uh, as a young man, um, as a, a mere 81, uh, a child. And now, what is my sound system? Do well, I have sound? Theoretically. Uh, Theoretically. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm maxed. Oops, is it frozen? I'm not maxed. Oh, there we go, now I'm maxed. And do you want to turn yours up? Because John Cobb needs to be heard at high volume. <laughs> I just want to show you a couple minutes. This is your, your lecture on Whitehead's model and multiple spiritualities. And I picked one toward the end where you talk about Whitehead. You just happen to talk about Quakers. But Whitehead did that as well. Oh, yeah. I know three passages in so Process and Directly, the relationship between individuals and God. And I have listed first discernment. Which is also I think if someone asks me what um, one form of spirituality is most immediately and directly follows from Whitehead's model, I would say discernment. And I'm using that to refer to Quaker and Jesuit forms mm -hmm. of spirituality. Now, Whitehead believed that in every moment, in every occasion of experience, God is present. God is one of the many that become one. And God's role in that happening, in that occurrence, is the role of providing a direction, providing a possibility, opening the doors in the desirable direction for that occasion to go. In other words, you could say guidance, leading. I mean, these are words that come, come more naturally from our Christian background. I like the word call, which is a good biblical word. I think in each moment, we are called to be and to do whatever is the best possible in that moment. And this is not something that is, can be simply deduced from our rational knowledge about the world. It's a supra-rational element in our experience. Now, that doesn't mean that I would take, say, the story of Abraham as the norm or the model. Quite the contrary, I think, in the vast majority of cases, that what we are called to be, we can also think and think through and see, yes, in this circumstance, that probably is the best thing to do without it running counter. But it's not always like that. Sometimes the call 
runs a little in tension with our rational expectations mm -hmm. and our judgments. And both Quakers and Jesuits believe that it is possible to become more sensitive to that particular feature of experience, to open ourselves to it, and to become more clearly aware of it. Mm. Now, the other feature of both of these traditions is that after one has, in silence and openness, appreciated and appropriated to the best of one's ability what one senses to be God's leading or God's call, it's shared in the community. Uh, we don't trust our individual ability to distinguish God's call from all the other hunches and desires and unconscious proddings that are going on in our experience all the time. So to go too far simply on one's own judgment is going too far, but that doesn't mean that the individual does not have the possibility of making helpful and useful discriminations as long as we don't absolutize any of these. Well, that... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Cobb. Well, <laughs> yeah. 2002. See if it'll pop back. That yeah. um, We got it. Excellent. All right. So we're going to um, to consider the other six examples. Well, this will go a little bit more quickly because we've covered process theology in some detail and um, seen a little bit how the Chris the history of Christianity is viewed from this process perspective. And we heard John Cobb on spirituality. What about an area where process wouldn't seem to have any role at all? Let's say biblical studies, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that a place where pure exegesis and pure rationality determine the meaning of the text? Well, if you're at CST, you know the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's John Cobb. Uh, no, first we'll do uh, Russell uh, Pregia on scripture and revelation. And he, he says, process thought can provide a way of understanding the biblical tradition as reflective of God's ongoing involvement in history, or Cobb calls it the living historic roots, routes, depending where you're from, right? So the biblical story understood as the biography of God. That's a fantastic notion. I didn't learn that at Fuller Seminary. Um, so that's the first part. But that has been nuanced by a recognition of the ambiguity of revelation. You heard that in the quote from, in the video from John Cobb a minute ago. Remember he said, we seek to discern, but it takes the role of a community to double check. So there's a natural ambiguity of revelation. That undercuts all fundamentalisms across the world's religions. I think in a, a way that's crucially politically important. That sentence is of geopolitical significance. Right? because it affects the planet and the fundamentalisms that fill so much of it. Finally, Whitehead's emphasis on freedom forecloses any notion of inevitable progress or a guaranteed historical outcome. There's a real openness to history. And actually, a friend of yours from 1963, Wolfgang Pannenberg, during the phase when he was under your influence, um, wrote a book uh, about the future of God and um, something like... Uh, uh, page No, 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 it was actually in Grundfragen der Systematischen Theologie, so these basic questions of theology. And he said in volume one, in history, die Gottheit Gottes steht auf dem Spiel. The very divinity of God is at stake in the course of history. If history doesn't move toward a harmonious place, then in some sense God wasn't God. For the process theologian, it needs to move there through what we all do, through our participation, and not with a sort of heavy-handed imposition of heaven on uh, the planet or the universe so that the uh, blessed ones go to heaven and the other ones go to hell with the, um, where there is gnashing of teeth, right? The sulfur smells rising up from the, uh, from the abyss, right? So this is a way of understanding the biblical tradition in these terms, which we wouldn't otherwise see. So as John Cobb put it in his famous essay on the authority of the Bible, 
the Bible still remains authoritative, and we understand the process of faith today, he says only, I would say, as a trajectory. Would you say, would you leave out the only now? As a trajectory whose early states are already discernible in the New Testament. You can tell me during the Q&A if you'd remove the, well, the word only now. I'll have to think. Oh, good. I've, I've, I've puzzled him. I've stumped him. <laughs> right. Um, without attention to the origins, we can't make reliable judgments in the present. So it's not a position that, that makes biblical studies unimportant. It, uh, biblical studies have a crucial place, and there is this development over time. One last uh, quote on biblical studies. This is from an opponent of process thought. The evangelical who now holds the Idrios chair at Oxford University, Alistair McGrath. And Alistair writes, for traditional theists, the God of process thought seems to bear little relation to the God described in the Old or New Testament. For many commentators, the real strengths of process theology lie in its insights into the origin and nature of suffering within the world. <laughs> and that second, the yellow sentence, seems exactly right. That is, as I said, the strength of process thought. But I'd like to say that the first sentence is just false. That there is actually no um, inferior way in which process uh, describes the Old and New Testament. I mean, think about the Hebrew Bible, right? I mean, here's a God who's changing, and I'll say his mind, as the text says, is um, developing in real relationship with the Israelites, right? And, and with uh, their ongoing development, uh, repents of decisions, right, is, is, seems to be in a kind of flux, as we read earlier, in the relationship with, uh, with humanity. And the New Testament also offers a God who is present. The phrase in Christ, in Christo, is repeated some 93 times in the New Testament. Um, there's a God, this um, Acts speaks, or Paul speaks in his sermon, in Athens, on the God in whom we live and move and have our being. So we're actually surrounded by this notion of a panentheistic God, a process God. Um, and Jesus' own spirituality in the Gospels is the spirituality of calling God Abba, Father, sort of like Daddy in Aramaic, right? So this clearly is an intimate God who interrelates, who's deeply related to Jesus throughout the New Testament. So Alice from McGrath, I think, mm -hmm. is simply wrong in the first statement in the sentence. And if you ask, let's say, Alistair, you really like the classical creeds. You like Thomas Aquinas. Tell me how the God of the creeds or of Thomas Aquinas is deeply related to us, even in the way that the, the Bible describes. I think it's far harder to make the creeds fit with the biblical picture than it is to make process theology fit with the biblical picture. Yeah. And that's a rather important statement, I think. Finally, finishing on biblical studies uh, with uh, Ron Farmer, he says that scholars informed by process theology see the most profound passages as pointing to a different understanding of divine power. And I would say outside of the quotes, namely one that is persuasive, all-influencing, and relational. So process theology leads us to read the biblical passages for what I think is their deepest insight, a relational God, a caring God, or as we, the Methodists would say, as Wesleyans would say, uh, like myself, that this is a God of prevenient grace, a God who always already has gone before us. When you walk into the room, the grace of God fills it like, like the air that's in the room. So the process God is the one that is this uh, different understanding of divine power, persuasive, all-influencing, relational, always already there. All right, homiletics, right? The art of preaching. How many of you have ever taken a homiletics class? Well, that's not very good. What happened to the old days when, like, weren't there like two homiletics classes required in classical theological? Schleiermacher is not happy. Right? All right. So Ron Allen says that the task of homiletical uh, theology is ever and always unfinished, a perfect process sentence, or ever and always beginning afresh, like a lot of our sermons, 
should be. From a process point of view, the preacher, the theologian, the congregation, and God are always in process with respect to seeking an adequate interpretation of God, of God's purpose and appropriate responses. Each new occasion calls forth fresh perceptions. It seems to me that the, the pastor, the preacher, the, the priest is the process theologian par excellence because he or she is looking at the world around, looking at the people, and seeking to interpret the ancient texts in light of the present. And isn't that a much more fundamentally process um, engagement than, than the alternative? I mean, if God is completely done, revelation occurred, then you don't need to apply it. You just state it. This is the truth. But if you need to search the scriptures to understand how they apply today's, today's thought, then you're a homiletician. One more. Homiletics, uh, Marjorie's co comment, it's as if God creates within the depths of each one of us and also on the surface through each one of us. God's word is a whisper, almost out of the range of our hearing. Ellipsis, almost, almost. And Margie, in this book, The Whispered Word, has a beautiful understanding of what the preaching is, what homiletics is, which is to reach out and to discover. Um, by the way, let me just acknowledge Rob Overy Brown, uh, who helped me put together the last part of this talk. So I want you to know that there was a process and a relational uh, <laughs> formation and that I had the privilege of working with one of our doctoral students to think this through. So um, all of our work is a partnership with Andrew, who made it work, and Josh Jett, who came in, and you, who create an atmosphere of intimacy and energy, right? So that nobody, it's what I learned from my Chinese friends. Zhe has said, uh, in China, nobody raises his head above everyone else. And if you do really well, then you spend more time thanking everyone else for their perfect performance, right? That's the Chinese way. And I think it's also the process way. It's not a, a philosophy of heroes. It's a philosophy of partnership. All right, let's move on to Christian education. Is, uh, oh, there's John. John Sweeney, where's John? Yeah. Oh, there you are, okay. John Sweeney is back um, after some time on the wrong coast. <laughs> so welcome back, John. No shorts today. Yeah. And he's a specialist in process and, and um, Christian education. Uh, so Mary Elizabeth Moore, the dean of the Boston University School of Theology, describes education, this opportunity to introduce ever new experiences and ideas to people. There's the process notion again. You introduce the new experiences to people who are also evolving at the same time. So at every intersection, we're confronted with God and the world of the past, present, and future. And we're called to draw these many influences into a unity. What's the famous quote from Whitehead that she's alluding to here? The many, go ahead, say it, Andrew. The many become one are increased by one. The many become one are in, and are increased by one. So when there are many ideas and you have that aha moment, you take all those ideas and bring them to a unity that you now understand. Ah, I get it. They're linked in this way. And when you have that insight, there's a new idea that now can be shared outward from you. Do you get it? So her, uh, Mary Elizabeth Moore's understanding of education is drawn from that process notion. All right, one more on, on Christian education. This is from uh, Encyclopedia of Christian Education. So about process, our Whitehead argued for non-dualism. So he shifted the focus away from the dichotomies, like mind versus body, male versus female, uh, God versus nature, to a more holistic sense of the education of the human person. With such a holistic approach on these fronts, Process relational theology has left a profound mark. I think that's exactly right. Education is always about holism. Holism, uh, integration, integrity, all these words are linked. Uh, actually, it's, it's from, uh, etymologically, um, integrity is from the uh, integer. An integer is a whole quantity, one, two, three, four, and so forth. So all of these concepts are, are related in the end. In short, ladies and gentlemen, if I can tie things together. I've given you a brief overview 
of some of the core ideas of process thought, as is the tradition of this lecture. I've tried to do so in a way that a person who'd never heard it before would be able to understand. And then I wanted to apply it to something that matters to many of you, and a lot of, for a lot of you, uh, your CST education matters, or whatever seminary you might go to, uh, if only because it's the biggest debt you'll ever take on in your life. <laughs> and I wanted to show that even when the word is not used in your theology class, your history of Christianity class, your um, biblical studies class, your homiletics class, your Christian education class, I left one out, um, sp uh, spiritual formation, the whole spiritual formation program is, is in a sense process, even though Frank and Andy don't often use that word. In fact, remember when I talked about sympathy? Uh, the, uh, that's the Greek root. The Latin translation is com or co-passion, having passion with, co-passion, which is Frank's specialization, compassion. Compassion practices, Jesus' radical way of compassion. So next time you see Frank Rogers say, hey, well, you're out of the closet now. <laughs> Phil Clayton recognizes that you are, you're really a process theologian. So the planet is this sort of integration of all the pieces, but as a living whole, as Gaia theory, Rosemary Redford Ruther would describe, it's, it's a living whole, not merely dead matter, but living uh, whole at the same time. Um, if you think of uh, Hurricane Ilana, or the most powerful hurricanes now that are on the planet caused by global warming, um, then you can recognize a massive interaction of particles and power. I'm almost done. Um, and its process offers you a world of our connection to each other, to the world, and to the divine. Thank you very much. Thank you.